Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. Welcome to the program, the Lamplight Study Fellowship Meetings. Once again, we have five Christian believers around the kitchen table, a mix of newcomers to Christ and others who've been studying Scripture for a few years. If you've not watched the last three programmes covering Section 1, please do so, otherwise you will miss important points raised. Do print out the study guide sheets required for the week so you can write down your own notes. And do watch all the short films hyperlinked on the study guide to get the best out of this study. Now, last week on the weekend show, Deborah and myself presented a summary of the last three programmes covering Section 1, so do go and have a look at that over on the Weekend Show channel. Continuing the study this week, our group moves on to Section 2, and are we here by chance or design? We trust that this study will benefit and encourage you, so don't forget to write in. God bless. and welcome back to the Lumpley Project study guide and this week we've got Marlon with us so I want to give a special welcome to Marlon. Thank you. And before we start I just want to open with prayer. Heavenly Father we thank you for today Lord. Father we thank you for bringing us here safely and Lord we thank you for the privilege of studying mm -hmm. your word. Lord we ask you to be with us, direct us and guide us and Father open up your scriptures to us. We ask this in Jesus name. Amen. 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 So this week we're doing section two, which is entitled Chance and Design. Um, I'll just read from, it's on page nine of the study guide, and I'll just read from this. It starts with a scripture. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, which is from Psalm 14.1. The big question, where did, where did we come from? The science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke said, two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. Most people at some point in their lives have asked questions like, where did life come from? What happens when I die? Is there a reason for my existence? A brief internet search reveals many opinions. So what evidence is there regarding the origins of life? There are two prevailing views. Naturalism, evolution, and two, intelligent design, special creation. And under that we have the list of films. And if we turn over to page 10, we have two scriptures here. Shona, could you read the first scripture, please? Yep. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And that's from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. The second scripture is from Romans 1, verses 18 to 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Thank you, Marlon. Now, if we go over to page 11, uh, it takes us to our first question. And it, it's think about and discuss, what is the definition of science? So obviously we've, we've watched through the films, 
Um, Steve Taylor specifically says he has, has a section what is science um, and it's mentioned through Roger Oakland what is science and it's mentioned in some of the other films an explanation of science so what does what does anybody think of that what, what, what would you say was science well <clears throat> I know what the definition is because I looked at it because I wasn't quite clear what the definition was so will I just read out read what it. the definition yeah. was Science Council defines science as being the pursuit and application of knowledge an understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. And I think the key word is evidence. Um, that's what we need to prove that something's right. Um, I remember um, doing basic science at school when you had your, your Bunsen burner and you'd mix chemicals together. Um, and that was all because you were testing a theory or you were testing something to produce a result. So the answer was the evidence to what you were trying to. That's kind of my understanding of science um, in, its, in its basic form. Um, so. And obviously in, the, in section two of the lamplight itself, it, it states that what the, you know what science is. Yeah. So it states it within yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Has anybody else any other ideas or other thoughts of what science would be or, or, or what you think science is even? Whether it be the right answer or not. I mean, as you grew up, what, what did you think science was? It's a search for truth, isn't it? For facts behind what we can observe and see around us um, everyday things and and beyond everyday things but it's looking for that evidence that those facts that will speak to us of what we are what is out there where we've come from everything about nature and the origin of mankind and of course the the word for um, science is derived from the latin word for knowledge so there is a knowledge there that we need to investigate and prove, as Shona said. Yep. So basically a, a search for the truth or a search for knowledge mm. would be something science. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, and as it says in the five minute notes of my, my um, science can lead you to all truth, um, knowledge. Steve Taylor explains that it's through experimentation, observation and repeatability as science. So obviously you've got to be able to observe something and you've got to be able to repeat something for it to be science. Do you think a lot of it is taken for granted? A lot of science, you're saying science is knowledge. Do you think it's just taken for granted and people don't question it? You know, you accept you know, the last time we were talking, we were talking about how, why do you believe anything? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> do we just accept something because it's told? Well, science is derived from the Latin word for knowledge. And in its broadest sense, it's knowledge, facts about the created world in which we live. Uh, the scientific method, of course, relies heavily on experimentation, observation, and repeatability so that what I might discover in my lab on day one has got to be able to be repeated on day two, day three, day four, etc. anywhere else uh, in any science lab around the world. And that's the power of science, observation and repeatability. And where observation or repeatability is lacking, then I think we have to put that science very much under the question mark under the microscope and ask what are our what is our basis for believing in the science which hasn't been observed and which can't be repeated when i used to think about science i always thought about what was in the sky like when you see the stars and when you see the moon and, and like a fallen star for example right. i used to wonder what that was and why was that happening but I think there is a lot that we take for granted. You just have to think of electricity for a start. We flick mm -hmm. a switch and the electricity comes on. And we don't all 
know why or how or we learnt it at school many years ago and can't remember it, you know, but we take it for granted. We assume that that will work. And at some point in our lives, we've probably been taught how and investigated it at that point. And, you know, then you just get on with life and, and assume a lot of things around that then. But yeah. I think it's fair to say, as you were saying, Shona, that if, if we're told something by a, a scientist or whatever, you just assume it's true and you take the word for it a lot of the time. Um, but going back to you know what Steve Taylor was saying, that you've got to be able to experiment, you've got to be able to observe this, and you've got to be able to repeat it. So, should you be doing that, or should you just be taking people's word for stuff? Obviously, you can't, everything you hear, you can't go and try it yourself to see if it works, but you should be looking at the evidence for it if it's something that interests you. I think if it interests you, then yes. But it, it's an interesting what interests people, mm -hmm. and a lot of things that maybe We'd, we'd come to a point in discussing science as, as a result of testing. It's not in everybody's everyday life. Like you're saying, you don't think about when you mm -hmm. flick a switch, you don't think about when you get in a car, you don't think about all these things. You just do them because they're either habitual or they're learned or you've learned it because it makes life easier. But you don't think about what's come about to make that all happen. Mm -hmm. You just accept. Um, if it's part of your job, you know, have you had to learn to do something as part of your job? Has it had any scientific root? Um, you know, that, that can all make you think. If you want to, if you're lazy and you don't want to, then you're just going to accept what, what's there. Mm -hmm. But if you're challenged on what you think about what you do or, or what you use, that's a different matter. I would say then you, you, you should have an understanding. So you're, you're shooting star or you're falling star, Alistair, did you ever, did ever go into look further into that as to what it actually was or how it happened? I didn't actually, but <coughs> um, do you know? That's, well, apparently it's a grain of sand in the atmosphere and burning up as it comes into the atmosphere. Right. So what people assume to be a star is usually just a tiny, tiny grain of something. And it's as it enters into the atmosphere, it, it burns up. Right. Given the illusion of a shooting star. So, okay. There you have it. Can I ask a question then? I, I, was, always, I was always told that the stars are travelling away from you. That they're, they're not coming towards you. So, I don't know if that's a, a theory or a hypothesis. Because a theory is supposed to be... Well... Based on fact. And they tell you that the universe is expanding and that everything's moving away. But you'll also read that the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the next galaxy closest to us, is actually moving towards us. Mm -hmm. And that in however many gazillion years we're going to collide. So, how does that work if everything's moving away? I don't know. Seems to be a contradiction. I don't know either. Okay. And I'm not. It's all the conflicting opinions, one person's opinion. You need to speak to somebody Doesn't like. <clears throat> like Danny Faulkner mm. to get a proper answer on that one, mm. but that's... Yeah. And then they would have to prove it, well, that was how they were doing that, how they were, how they were coming to that, that conclusion. How they were measuring the distances mm. and whatnot, yep. What I find confusing is, obviously I was at school quite a long time ago, and things were less confusing. It's in the last 50 years that there's more and more contradictory things coming out, really since you know, um, I was in my teens, but before that, it, I'm sure there were things out there, but it wasn't in the schools, it wasn't so obvious. So I grew up believing that the stars were, you know, moving towards us. I never heard a contradiction of that when I was young, but now you hear so many things that contradict what I learned or what I've learned since, you know, um, so it's difficult finding out the truth and it's a case of isn't it listening to more than one person and doing a bit of research and and trying as far as possible to prove it for yourself but we don't all have minds that can deal with you know expert topics on in science particularly you know so so it's learning what you can investigating what you can and weighing things up 
and just you know, making sure you're as informed as you can be and making the best judgment. And trusting the experts mm. that tell you. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, taking it back to that rather than a lot of different thoughts mm -hmm. and ideas from people who, who maybe don't have that knowledge and yeah. don't um, bow to that knowledge but still want to have their own opinion put forward. Mm. So that's an unscientific answer, but... <coughs> Can you prove that? No, I can't <laughs> prove that. <laughs> Moving on to our next question. Um, think about, discuss, what is the theory of evolution? Um, can I open that one up by asking everybody around the table, what do you think they mean by evolution? What, what, what comes to mind? And I'm not looking for a complicated answer. Just what do you think about, you know, when somebody says, oh, well, what is the theory of evolution? What, what would you say it was? I would say it was um, like an animal that is changing its body to suit its surroundings. Right. Or the change in its surroundings. That's the way I always thought of it anyway. Okay. Any thoughts, either? Um... I hadn't really, you know, ever really took on board the theory of e evolution, you know. Um, I just remember the pictures of the, you know, the ape, and then, you know, you would get all the different, you know, you just went from this yeah. to that, and it, I just kind of didn't, it didn't make sense to me, mm -hmm. evolution, you know, basically. I, think I just thought, how can they prove that? Because where's the evidence? Like you say, you need evidence, you know. Um, of a, I mean, why you still got monkeys and, you know, we people. So how ridiculous, to me it was quite ridiculous, I thought. They call that it a missing link, thing. but um, it's missing because it isn't there. It's <laughs> 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 a good point. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's obvious when you put it that way. It is, isn't it? I think what Heather's talking about is probably the first place that most people go because we've seen these pictures so often, yeah. haven't we? Whenever evolution is mentioned, you have these diagrams of, you know, going from ape to, to man and all his complexity and all the rest of it. So I think that's the first thing that comes to mind. It, it's like life has moved from a simpler form to a more complex form. And, and they talk, from my memory and, and what I've been investigating, they talk about um, this development of life, you know, from, from the simple to the complex and the weaker falling by the wayside. But that to me never made sense because we still have all the weak things with us. So surely if we were moving from the weak to the strong, then there are things we shouldn't have. They should have long ago fallen by the wayside and there is no evidence of that. And we have the evidence of weakness still in society, in humanity, in nature, you know, so, so that doesn't, sound logical to me at all. I can't get my head around it. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was young and growing up, like you said, Heather, I saw the picture of the, the monkey and the ape and, and you saw it and you kind of was told that's, that's how you came about. Although even as a young child, I was a church goer and I maybe didn't have an understanding that I do now, but part of me, was taken in what I was told at church, but part of me was also being taught at school. So, like yourself, seeing the picture, there was a certain part of me that thought, maybe that, maybe that is how we came about. Because I wasn't being told anything different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, there was no evidence to say, well, that couldn't possibly be the case. Although, um, you know, there are, there are when you read the Bible, it tells you differently. But then I was, if I, I'm thinking of maybe being eight, nine, ten, that kind of age. So I maybe didn't question how you would question as an adult. But um, I did used to think that that was pretty cool, actually, seeing all these apes and then growing into. But I did wonder how an ape would then talk, because mm. an ape doesn't talk. Mm. Um, and then, of course, that does fit into the, 
the millions of years that people talk about. Because, like, well, in my brief, brief lifespan, there's been no change. So it would have to take gazillions mm -hmm. of years. So, yeah, evolution. I don't think it, it was a word that was banging around the classroom when I was no. at school. And I was the same, you see, we never really heard it. No. It's, um, it's been a, a more recent thing. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. So what we're all really saying is what we think about when, when we, we talk about evolution is the picture we've all seen that you're changing from, from monkey into man kind of thing. That's what you think about in evolution. But a few other points here. Um, briefly, there's six types of evolution talked about. There's cosmic evolution, which is like the origin of space and time. Um, that's related these days to the Big Bang. The Big Bang caused the origin of the universe. Now, there's no evidence for that, and Danny Faulkner in his film, he explains that far better than I could. So, cosmic evolution is one. Then with chemical evolution, apparently the, the sort of given is that all chemicals evolved from hydrogen. Um, again, there's no evidence for that. Going on to number three with stellar and planetary evolution. Um, where the top obviously stars and planets are formed. Now they talk about gas clouds, where the stars come from. Um, you'll hear that on astronomy programs that um, nebula is the birthplace of stars and stars have been formed there. Nobody's ever seen a star being formed. We've seen a star exploding into a supernova where it was brilliant light comes out of it and that's it dying if you like. They'll talk about stars being born. It's never been observed. So that's another one that's unobservable. Um, organic evolution, life from non-life. That's never been observed. Um, Macroevolution, changing from one kind to another. And as Alistair said, it, you know, the missing link. Well, why are they called missing? Um, there's no evidence of that. And then we go on to microevolution, which is variation and adaptation. Um, this is observable. Now, this is what Darwin observed basically with the finches, with the different beaks and things. It was adaptation to their environment and variations amongst the kind. Now, because that's observed and can be proven, the rest of them seem to fall under the banner that, oh, well, that's evolution as well, so therefore they're all true. But when, when you really look at it, it's only microevolution that you can observe. And I think it's um, taken quite out of context, because as we say, we, we went round the table and what do you think evolution? And we've all said, well, it's the, the ape turning into man and whatnot. That's what everybody, or the majority of people, think when you talk about what is evolution. Um, so what are you saying? There's no, well, there's no proof for evolution then? <laughs> not really, no. No, right. well, no that's what I took from no. exactly what you said. There's no proof because it can't be. And again, if you listen to the experts in the films, um, Roger Oakland, what is evolution? Um, Again, he can explain it far better than I can. He's far more educated than me, and he'll go into a lot more detail on it. Um, and even listening to the, the rest of the films that are on the list, um, it states in them that there is no evidence for it. Now, as we've talked about what is science, it must be observable and repeatable. So where's the, where is the evidence for evolution? Um, Ray Comfort done a good film, I can't remember the name of it, and he was going round and he was interviewing various academics about the, the origin of life, how life begun, um, or how a species changed into another species, and their answer was always, oh, there's hundreds of examples. And he would ask them, well, name me one, and they couldn't do it. And then obviously they turned the argument to having a go against him, and he was this, that, and the next thing because they couldn't answer the question. And there was one or two of them were actually, you saw the light bulb coming on, but they were like, I can't give you an example. So I, I found that extremely interesting as well. Um, obviously the films 
that, that was listed there, there's good stuff in them as well. Now, there, there's other films in amongst that. I mean, to be honest, the evolution, you know, the head and creation evolution, what films do you watch and what don't you? Because to me, I think you should watch them all, mm -hmm. personally. Because there's so much information in there. Um, See, Dave, when you spoke about the Finches and you spoke mm. about, they called it adaptation. Mm. Is that what they called it? Adap adaptation. That's Finches adapting to their surroundings. To their environment, yeah. Yeah, so they're basing that in, on evolution. Well, that was one of the main things in Darwin's book. Right. Um, that it was the Finches and they had the different beaks and the different ones are different beaks, so therefore they were, they were evolving from one thing to another. Um, Darwin's book is actually a bit of a minefield. Um, there's six editions of Darwin's Origin of Species. And it's interesting, if you take his own theory that things get better as they go along, you would assume that the sixth edition is the best one because it's evolved, yeah. if you like. Uh, I have a couple of quotes we can come back to later on that, uh, the sixth one. But there's one, this is maybe a bit long-winded, but when we're talking about the birds anyway, in the first edition of his book, uh, I'll quote it here, Yet in North America there are woodpeckers which feed largely on fruit, and others with elongated wings which chase insects on the wing, and on the plains of La Planta, where, where not a tree grows, okay, where not mm -hmm. a tree grows, there is a woodpecker which in every essential part of its organisation, even its colouring and the harsh tone of its voice and undulatory flight told me plainly of its close blood relationship to our common species, yet it is a woodpecker which never climbs a tree. So he's saying it never climbs a tree and not a tree grows in La Planta. Now if you go on to the fifth edition, the book, mm -hmm. talking about the same thing, blah blah blah, exactly the same, on the plains of La Planta, where hardly a tree grows, so he's changed it from no trees to hardly a tree, there is a woodpecker which has two toes before and two behind and a long pointed tail feathers sufficiently stiff to support the bird in a vertical position on a post, but not so stiff as in the typical woodpecker and a straight long beak. So he's kind of contradicting himself there, but he goes into a lot more detail on the woodpecker to try and suggest that it's not quite a woodpecker, mm -hmm. but it's getting there. Obviously, these are different species, I would say, rather than they're evolving from a woodpecker. You know, he's, he's calling it a woodpecker, and then he's saying that this woodpecker's evolving because it's the trees are going and or that. And well, if he's reporting on something he's observed, it's totally different in his first edition. Than it is in the fifth yeah, edition. The fifth. So he's changing his which, tune as he goes. Which one's the right story? Do you see and what I'm I mean? I'm just thinking it? here, sorry, but you know, while you're speaking from from baby to adult, we all change. You see the the form, our form changes, and our shape can change through diet and everything. You know. You see what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Our features change. Yeah, yeah. So the birds, you know, yeah. and their environment, and we have to change in whatever environment we go into as human beings. We, we all have mm. to change, you know, what, any different environment you're being put into, like your work environment, or if you go on holiday, you have to adapt, you know, to the heat and things even. But... And but yeah, baby. but growing, mm -hmm. just growing, for example, your, your shape changes, you know, you look different when you look at your picture from when, a photo from when you're eight year old to when you're 38 year old. Some people might see the likeness and things, but you know, mm. your features and everything yeah. will look different, you know. And you adapt from a baby as well, yes. you can't eat a... a, a regular diet as a baby, yeah. so your body will adapt and grow yeah. and mature. That's yeah. that's adapting, but that's not evolving. Yeah. No, your species isn't changing. You're adapting yeah. to the, as you say, the environment you're, you're yeah. living in. 
Yeah. Um, but even back to, you know, he's talking about the beaks of the finches and whatnot. Say you had whatever and the seed was an inch deep and just as an example, well, anything with a longer beak is going to get the seed and anything with a shorter beak is going to die of starvation. So therefore, the ones with a longer beak is going to live and the ones with shorter beak are going to die out. That's kind of what they're saying. Yeah, that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. They're they still a bird. Different than, than it's the not changing into a tortoise or it's not changing no. into an elephant. It's no. still a bird. It's still mm-hmm. a bird. Still the same species. Still the same. Still the kind. same. Yes. Or even yes. with a fish, a fish can have a bigger tail and it makes it go faster so it can catch the faster fish that it's trying to feed on and, and uh, other fish will feed on like plants and things on the bottom. And if you look at what um, David Attenborough is doing with the Blue Planet programmes and you see the creatures that are on the bottom of the sea that we've never been aware of in, in many cases before and you see the way that they adapt. You've got fish that walk along the bottom of the sea, you know. So within each species there are adaptations for the environment, as you say, Shona, that we're living in. But that doesn't change the species. Mm-hmm. It means it's a type within that species. But it's still... How clever. Yes, <laughs> brilliant. How clever it just, exactly. oh, to have a, a creature that can adapt mm-hmm. to its surroundings. That's right. How clever. Yeah. I've written here, um, it's interesting so many theories um, that believers of evolution, but they can't seem to decide on one theory. So if, if believers of evolution really believed in it, surely they would just follow one path mm. and that would be their supporting evidence. But because it's all such a vague kind of environment that they're talking in, it, you're never really sure, even when you listen to people who discuss evolution, they never really seem to get to the, the one answer that... Mm supports everything that they're trying to say. But everybody knows it's true. That's, that's, <laughs> their, that's their argument. And is that not a little bit of um, philosophy or, or psychology that if you if you say something regularly and often enough, it becomes a fact? That's true, yes. That if you keep repeating uh-huh. something yeah. and it's spoken about and it's printed in a book and it's read or taught or believed, then it must be a fact because it's from a book. It must be true. Where's the evidence to say it isn't, and then that led to mm-hmm. a different a different word. Well, I think we've kind of moved into our next question, the two kind of morphed together. What is the factual evidence? What factual evidence is there for the theory of evolution? And we've covered that a wee bit. And as you were saying, Shona, if we're told often enough, even at the school nowadays, especially, especially in school, if don't you're yeah. only being told that evolution is how it mm-hmm. happened. Well, it's obvious, that's how it happens. You're going to believe it. That's what you're going to believe. And you only have to listen. I mean, you put the TV on or even listen to the radio, and regardless of what it is, whether it's a hill-walking programme or whatever, somewhere in there, (laughs) nine times out of ten, they'll be climbing a hill and they'll tell you, oh, this is so many gazillion years old. And How do you know that? Mm -hmm. So... And again, like the Blue Planet program, they'll always be talking about, oh, such and such evolved from mm-hmm. this and this evolved from that. Now, if you knock their theory right back to basics, um, we all evolved out of a rock, if you want to put it that way. Because their theory is that it rained on the rocks for millions of years and all these chemicals went into the water, the primordial soup, and then life began. So take it right back to basics. We all came from a rock. Now, how ridiculous is that? Um, I don't know. Well, I've got something written here. I've written it in my last question, but it relates yeah, to what you were fine. saying. Because the two go together. Um, that from non-life came life. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what the evolutionary people believe. Mm-hmm. And bio means life, and genesis means beginning. Mm-hmm. So, um, so from non-life came life. Is biogenesis. A-biogenesis. A-biogenesis, without life. Abiogenesis is life originating from non-living material and it's unsupportable scientifically. Mm. So there's nothing to prove mm. that. So I was getting my E's and my, my bio was muddled up. Because <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> um, I'm not a scientist. But, um, yeah. I don't know if it's hard, I don't think, mm. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. And I've got, I think this was from one of the films, um, possibly Danny Faulkner. The theory explains everything happened in an instant when mm. he's talking about 
creation of, of, of Earth or life. Earth expanded very rapidly, faster than the speed of light. But there's no scientific evidence this actually happened. Well, it's a universe that expanded. Mm -hmm. Is that a universe expanded? Uh -huh. Okay, right. Well, that's him referring to the Big Bang. And as he, as he goes on to talk about in the film, that, that the physics and the theories they've got that make sense at the moment don't work for the Big Bang theory. Mm. They don't work. They fall apart. So you can't even, you don't have evidence for it. And the theories that they've got don't work. Mm. So as he says, well, if, if the theories don't work, what does that tell you? The original conditions of the, of the supposed Big Bang are, are pretty much unknown. You know, people have been trying to reconstitute uh, some little tiny elements of that by high temperatures they can produce in particle accelerators. And we also have a problem with our theory. You push it back what's called the Planck time, uh, back in the very early parts of the universe, uh, our physics breaks down. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, we've got fantastic uh, quantum mechanics that works. We have fantastic uh, general relativity. But when you push it back to the high densities and high temperatures required by the initial Big Bang, our theories do not work. And if our theories break down, could it possibly suggest that maybe the universe doesn't have a naturalistic explanation. You cannot use the physics we have in order to explain these things. And I think this kind of takes you into the, the idea of, of, of a creator once again. If you push your physics to the point that they break down, maybe that's an indication that naturalism does not work. As Danny Faulkner says in one of the films, that the evolutionists are very good at saying, but we'll eventually find the evidence yep. which proves they don't actually have yep. it now. And yet it's being taught to our children as if it's hard fact. But they themselves say, we don't actually have the evidence now, but you know, we'll find it. What way is that to base? Who, dec who decides what uh, our children are taught in the schools then? Who decides that? Uh, I don't know who, who actually decides on that councils one. Councils are educationalists mm -hmm. who are often paid by councils who have maybe an agenda. They're, maybe often. they're evolutionary people. Maybe. <laughs> probably will be. Yeah. Probably well, that explains a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it That's does. what I mean, they must be getting taught. Uh -huh. Yeah. And when children are taught one thing by a teacher whom they love, because it used to drive me mad when my children came home from school and said, Miss So-and-so says, I used to say, well, I don't care what Miss So-and-so says, listen to me, you know. And I hear my daughter with her children, and it's the same thing. Children soak it up like sponges because this teacher knows, everything. knows it all, and mummy and daddy don't know anything very much at all. So if they're only being taught the one thing, that's what they'll absorb, and that's what they'll build their understanding on. It goes way back to mm. the first section when you're talking about trusting who, what you believe mm. and you trust and mm. kids will believe their teacher, they'll trust their teacher because yeah. they've been taught by their teacher. Mm. So if the teacher's telling them that one thing about evolution, they'll believe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and especially if they go back to a home where the parents either don't know, don't care or are evolutionists themselves, yeah. the children are not getting the opportunity at all to weigh up what they're being told. Whereas I think when I was at school, we got far more opportunity to hear different, different you know, views. views and theories and to interact with them. You weren't slapped down. You were, you were given the opportunity to, no. give, to give your view or, you know. Nothing you said was out of bounds. Everything no. was allowable. Uh -huh. As long as you were inquiring yes. and you were bringing valid questions and uh, and seeking to learn, yeah. But now it's it's like force feeding them. You know how the Roman Catholic Church says, "Give me a child by the age of until they're seven, and, and we've got them for life." And it's it's almost like that in the schools. Get them young enough, and we've got them for hmm. life. You know. It's like it's quoted in the films again. It's like the education system are teaching people what to think, not how to think, mm -hmm. so. And that's a very dangerous state, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um. So back to the question again, what factual evidence is there for the theory of evolution? Can anybody think of any example? No. 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 You know, they'll come up with things like, you know, Piltdown Man was one of the, the good examples that, that was out. Um, it was supposed to be one of the missing links, mm -hmm. sort of halfway between ape and man. Um, 
it was proved to be a hoax, but it's still quoted, even though it's been proven to be a hoax. And if you're watching that on television, you're going to believe it. Yeah, if you watch a documentary, and, and there has been several, or YouTube, TV, whatever, on all these things, they still talk about it as if it's a fact, Yeah. even though it's been proven a hoax. And again, one of the films, I don't think it's in amongst the list there, they, they talk about something like that will come out, and there's big headlines that they found this, that, and the next thing. And then maybe a couple of months or whatever later, it's disproved. There'll be a tiny little column somewhere near the back pages of the paper or whatever saying, oh, well, this is, you know, it, it's actually, it's not what we thought it was, it's X, Y, Z. But by that time, because the headline's been out, everybody's read the headline. Everybody remembers the headline. But nobody's seen nobody a little bit Nobody the wee bit few months later saying, oh, well, by the way, this wasn't really right. So that goes back to what I said about if you read something often enough, yeah. discuss it with your peers, you read the same thing. Um, I mean, I think I said before in, in, yeah. in previous sections that, you know, if you say something that's slightly contrary to just what a group of people are saying, you're the odd one. Oh, you're you're the one that's, you know, strange because you don't yeah. agree with their mm -hmm. way of thinking. So. Um, like you just said there, that's, if it's in the paper, um, people will believe it. Um, yeah, and I think people often just read a headline. They don't actually read further. Yeah. And most people won't investigate it further. So you're right, if there's a retraction later on in a tiny space, people won't even notice it's there, never mind read it or check or it out. Or talk about it even. Exactly. Yeah. By that time, it's, mm. it's too late. So any other thoughts for examples of evolution? Well, I, I like what Danny Faulkner said. <laughs> he quoted Star Trek. He quoted, <laughs> he quoted Star Trek as being more factual than, yes. than some of the <laughs> um, evolutionary What's science. What's Star Trek? Well, nothing. No, I, I remember watching Star Trek. As long as we remember it's fiction. It's fiction. <laughs> science, science fiction, fiction, he says, supports the universe coming about naturally. Because the evidence was obviously in the mm. programme, so I quite liked that. I thought that was quite amusing. Um, and I've also just written, you can't test the arguments put forth about the plausibility of the Big Bang Theory. Because there aren't any. Mm -hmm. So... They'll talk about background radiation, background microwave radiation and whatnot, but... And going, going back to what um, Danny Faulkner said, um, you, you mentioned all the, the, ma the matter and expansion theory and he also said um, that none of the above were known 30, 40 years ago when he was a student or a young scientist. So making the source of the Big Bang Theory unstable, unbelievable, un uncreditable. So does that mean that they're always going to come up with a theory in the next 30 years time? It reminds me of a certain religion which changed the goalposts every time they're theory or their prophecy doesn't or whatever happen. you want to call it doesn't happen when they say it will happen so they just shift the goalposts and this is what this speaks to me about mm. because Roger Oakland brings out in one of the films as well that even the Darwinian tree of life lacks any observable evidence yeah. and that's you know kind of like their mantra that's what they're basing so much on and there is no observable evidence there at all. So, but yeah, we'll shift the goalposts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I had took down notes that it was the same chance as finding a lottery ticket um, every week in the same place. That's that's the odds of it. Mm. For the next thousand years. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, yeah. It's crazy. Right, that was it. Uh, given the it's example totally of a protein molecule yeah, arising by yeah, chance. Mm. By chance yeah. Was the same it's as finding a winning yeah. lottery ticket every week. Yeah. For a thousand years, what's the chance of finding it once? I know. <laughs> Let alone every know. week for a thousand years. That's crazy, that's isn't sad. it? Absolutely mm -hmm. crazy. So, well, that's us more or less out of time. So we'll leave it on that. Um, and obviously, we've got a lot more to discuss in the in the next episode. So thank you all for your input. And then until the next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is GV247.tv.
bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world, plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion, and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries and study materials. At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series, a powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on GV247.tv, our free service web TV channel. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, please do not hesitate to get in touch.